1 Samuel chapter 14, right at the game, I'm just going to let you know, this is going to be a two-parter. There's just, there's just so much here to, to go through and so many applications that can be made. So we're just going to go through here the first part. And uh, I would entitle this, this sermon tonight, you know, 1 Samuel 14, The Fearful and the Faithful. The Fearful and the Faithful. And then when you read these first few verses, it's real easy to see very quickly who is the fearful and who is the faithful in the story. It says in verse 1, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his, far, his father. So you can see right away, Jonathan's the one who wants to go fight. He's the one who wants to go do something, like we saw last week. You know, this is kind of a repeat of the story. It's not the exact same story, but, you know, Jonathan hasn't changed since last week, since chapter 13. He still wants to go out and take on the Philistines. He wants to go attack. He's not about just sitting around like Saul was. We saw one year went by and two years went by. He's got some zeal. He wants to go get something done. He is the faithful in the story. And it goes on in verse 2 and said, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him, about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, uh, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. So it's really easy to see who the fearful is in this story. It's Saul. I mean, Saul here, you know, uh, is tarrying, it says, in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. So get the picture here. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's actually retreating in the story. You know, and, and, if you, and if you go back to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13, look at verse 2. It says, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. So where did he start out in, in chapter 13? He, well, he was in Michmash, right? It says Saul was in Michmash and in Mount Bethel. So he's in Michmash, right? And then we know the story, you know, the, 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 uh, the Philistines, you know, Saul or Jonathan goes out and he, and he attacks. The Philistines respond. And so then he goes and goes down to, uh, you know, wait on um, in Gilgal for Samuel to come and offer sacrifices. And you know the story, you know, that, that he, he forces himself and, and, and he gets rebuked. And it says in verse 15 of chapter 13, And Samuel rose and gat him up from Gilgal unto the Gibeah of Benjamin. So he leaves Gilgal, but does he go back to Michmash? No, he actually he goes to Gibeah, where he is in, verse, in chapter 14. Now, why is it that he did that? Why did he uh, go to Gibeah and not back to Michmash? Well, if you look in chapter, thir or chapter 13, verse, uh, uh, look at verse uh, 15, And Samuel rose and got him, uh, got him up from Saul, uh, uh, from Gilgal unto Gibeah, rather, of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were with, present with him, about 600 men, and Saul and Jonathan's son and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin and the Philistines encamped in Michmash. So in chapter 13, you know, Saul is in Michmash. Then he makes this big, you know, mistake in trying to, in forcing himself to offer. And then the Philistines are, are taking over. So they're coming into the land, they're pressing. And then we go over to chapter 14 and Saul, it says there, has gone all the way back to uh, Gibeah. He's in the uttermost part of Gibeah. It's not just that he's in Gibeah. Now, if you, if you kind of know the lay of the land out there, you know, Gibeah was up in the mountains. You know how Jerusalem is up in a mountain? That's why it says that they always came down from Jerusalem no matter which direction they went. It's talking about changes of, an ele of, ele of elevation. So what's going on here is he's not just in Gibeah, but he's like he's up in the mountains. So he's hiding. He's gone up in, a, in elevation, and he's, he's hiding out. He's gotten pushed out of Michmash where he was in chapter 13. Because if you remember last, last week, chapter 13 didn't end well. You know, they, they, they were just being further oppressed. God didn't deliver them that day. All he got was rebuked, and then the, then the Philistines just pushed their way in. <laughs> so it says he's in the uttermost part of Gibeah, and he's under a pomegranate tree in, in Migron, and the people that are with him, about 600 men. So he's hiding out, right? He's got the son of Phinehas with him. And this just reminds me a lot of a lot of Christians today. There's a lot of Christians that are like this today. They're, they're hiding. They're, kind of, they're fearful is why they're hiding. Because like I said last week, you know, in chapter 13, if you're going to do something big for God, you can just mark it down that you're going to have a fight on your hands. That the Philistines are going to hear about it, and they're going to gather themselves, and they're going to fight. Now, there's two ways you can respond to that. You can either run and hide like Saul here, or you can be like Jonathan. You can either be fearful, or you can be like the faithful. And I use faithful not, not just in the sense of loyal, but faithful as in like courageous. Because in order to be faithful, you have to have courage. 
You have to have, you can't have this fear in your heart. You have to have a, 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 not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind to go out and do the work of God, to take on the enemy. So that's the difference in between these two characters in the story, between Jonathan and between Saul. Jonathan is somebody who's faithful, somebody who's got courage, someone who wants to go out and do something and fight, whereas Saul, you know, he just wants to lay around and be lazy and stay out of the fight and take it easy, okay? And that's what's going on here. And this reminds me a lot of Christians, reminds me a lot of preachers even. I mean, they're, they're tearing in the uttermost parts of Gibeah. They're staying away from the fight. You know, the preacher who's, you know, got all of his sermons behind like a paywall on his website. You know, you got to pay to get them. You can only get access if you send them like a, you know, uh, uh, you send them your email and it confirms who you are. Make sure you're not, you know, a member of the LGBT HIV community. He wants to make sure that you're not going to just broadcast. Even if he, if he even has the guts to preach the whole word of God to his own people. Then there's even the guy who's he's in the utter, uttermost parts of Gibeah. He's not even willing to preach to his own people the word of God. He's, he's going to go to certain passages and be like, oh, let's not read about that. I wouldn't want to, you know, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. You know, and that's not what we should be as preachers. And, you know, one of my favorite sayings that I think of often as a preacher is, hey, if I'm rubbing the cat the, the wrong way, the cat can turn around. That's what I, how I heard it said. And I said, that's good. I like that. That's how preachers ought to be. They ought to be hiding in Gibeah, in the uttermost parts of Gibeah, fearing the enemy, what's going to take place. They're hiding out. They don't want to go fight. And not only that, you know, you say, well, why, why would you just hide out like that? How, I mean, that can't be very nice. That's got to be, you got to feel ashamed, right? I mean, if you were a, a, man, a supposed man of God, if you were a king like Saul, and your whole job is to go out and fight battles, wouldn't you feel kind of ashamed? Yeah. You should. Wouldn't you feel that you're kind of, you know, not doing your duty? I mean, that's how I would feel as a preacher if I didn't preach every, every, every word of, the, uh, of every, you know, every line, every chapter, every verse of this book good or bad, and just let it, let it lay. You know, <laughs> so you ask yourself, how is it that somebody can be like that? How can somebody just hide out and not do their job? How can King Saul just be in the uttermost parts of Gibeah while the land that he has, you know, it, that, it, uh, uh, that is, it's his duty to protect that land, but he's just hiding out and letting the Philistines just have their way, push him out of Michmash, sending out the spoilers, so on and so forth. Why is he doing that? I'll tell you why. Because he's comfortable. He's gotten used to it because he enjoys it. I mean, that's what it says there. He's in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree. You think that's a coincidence that he found a pomegranate tree? I mean, you could have, I'm sure there's more than one tree up there in the uttermost parts of Gibeah. You know, he didn't go find, you know, the, the worthless, you know, what's a worthless tree? You know, I mean, I guess every tree has some kind of worth, right? But not every tree is a fruit tree, is it? Not every tree is going to bear delicious fruit for you to just sit around and enjoy. You know, some trees are just, they're good for shade. That's about it. Some of them are just, you know, all they're good for is making a mess in your yard and give your kids something to do, right? So he goes up there and he finds himself not a pine tree, you know, not, a, not any other kind of tree. He goes, oh, there's a nice pomegranate tree up here. You know, and pomegranate trees, they grow 20, 30 feet tall. They have big, you know, I can just see Saul up there just the, under this tree just being weighed down by all these pomegranates. Just, <laughs> hey, Saul, man, the, the Philistines are taking over. They're in Michmash. Oh, well, you know what? No, we'll get to that later. And that's how, that's how, how else do you explain somebody just sitting around, not doing their job, being afraid of the enemy and not being ashamed of it and just being okay with it? It's because they get comfortable. You know, and, and, and preachers do this, leaders do that, Christians do this. They get used to just, you know, pulling out of church, getting out of church, getting comfortable in their sin, just taking it easy, enjoying life, just going through the moat, you know, not, and not, you know, fighting the battles. Christians do this too. They retreat, and then they get comfortable. And once you get comfortable, man, it's hard to come down from underneath that pomegranate tree. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why I think it says at the end of verse 1 about Jonathan, but he told not his father. He just went and did it. He said, what's the point in telling the old man? He's got his pomegranate tree. He's not going to do anything. I already, I've been watching him. You know, he let one year go by, he let two years by. He's doing nothing. I'm the one that's going to go out and start all these fights and try to deliver these people. There's no point in even telling him. And that's how a lot of Christians get, you know, once they get underneath, up in the uttermost part, once they get out of the fight and they start to enjoy the fruits of just being comfortable in life, it's really hard to get them back into the fight. You know, once you get out of church, it's really hard to get back in church. So here's the trick. Don't get out of church. <laughs> you know, once you quit reading your Bible, it's really hard to get back into your Bible reading. You want to know what the trick is? Don't quit reading your Bible. You know, apply that to any discipline in the Christian life. Soul winning, Bible memory, 
whatever, whatever thing it is that you need to do as a God's child, once you stop doing it, it's harder to get back into the habit of doing it. So the secret is don't stop doing it. Don't be like Saul. Don't get out of the fight and then find yourself a pomegranate tree and just hang out and take it easy. <coughs> and he's got, so he's like, and here's the thing, you know, I'm going to tell you that. You know, you're going to come to church. That's what you're going to hear. You know, hey, don't get comfortable. Don't get out of the fight. You know, get back in the fight. You know, don't be like Saul. Don't be fearful. But, you know, the problem with being up there in the under the pomegranate tree with Saul is that not only is he comfortable, but he's got his yes men with him, doesn't he? He's got all his yes men. It says there, he had, you know, Saul was tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is a Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And I believe this is, and you'll see that word 600. We saw it last week. There were 600 men that followed him trembling after everybody else scattered. This is probably the guys that went with him back when he uh, was, or, or, you know, ordained king. And it says when he went back to his home, there went with him 600 men, a band of men whose, God, whose hearts God had touched. I believe that's who this is. So they started out right. You know, they're following their leader. They're doing what they're supposed to do. But then they just kind of got comfortable right along with Saul. And they're hanging out. And they say, hey, Saul's a good guy. Hey, Saul, can I have one of those pomegranates? Yeah, hey, sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, Saul, you know what? There's no need to fight. <laughs> you know, we're good. The, the Philistines will leave eventually. Uh, how about some more pomegranates? And this is how churches go downhill. Is they get a leader who says, you know what? I don't want to fight anymore. You know what? I don't feel like taking a stand anymore. You know what? We're going to change things around. We're going to compromise. And then you, know, then you have all the yes men are like, yeah, you know, pastor, that sounds good. Maybe you should do that. You know, you've been fighting a long time. Just take it easy. You know, then you got the, 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 the deacon run church where the deacons are all like, yeah, let's put that to a vote. Yeah, we agree. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stop preaching so hard on this subject. We're going to get rid of the King James. We're going to bring in a newer version. You know, we're going we're gonna to stop dressing, like, you know, nicely. We're going to get some graphic tees and some torn-up shorts. <laughs> Let's get rid of this old wood pulpit. Let's just get some nice glass, you know, plexiglass-looking thing. You know, and, and you don't need that old lapel. It looks so stuffy. You get one of them nice little, you know. <laughs> some, some preacher, I can't remember who it was. They had, like, the perfect name for it. I, can't, I wish I could remember right now. But, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, when, when, when leaners go bad, you know, there's, there's plenty of people that will go, yeah, it sounds good. Because secretly, in a lot of people's hearts, that's what they've wanted the whole time. They've wanted Saul to go, I wish, you know, I wish Saul would just take us up to the uttermost parts of Gibeah and feed us pomegranates. I wish he'd just get us out of the fight. And, you know, a leader could give in to that. Now, I think here, Saul, obviously, he was the one that was doing the leading and, and led him up there. But how is it that a man becomes fearful and refuses to do the job that he's called to do? One, he gets out of the fight. Two, he gets, uh, he's a, he gets comfortable. And then three... You know, he surrounds himself with people who are just going to tell him what he wants to hear. He gets his yes men around him. <laughs> and what's interesting, too, is that, you know, he keeps his form of religion. You know, I, I believe Saul is a saved man, obviously, but look here in verse 3, and it says, And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. That's who he had with him in the uttermost parts of Gibeah, up there chewing on pomegranates, was this guy, Ahiah. Now, you should recognize some of those names. From earlier on in 1 Samuel. Names like Phineas, the son of Eli. Remember, the son of Belial. And what did God say about them? Well, let's go back there to chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3. So who is this guy, Ahiah? Who is he? What's he doing there? Well, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 3, look at verse 10. This is when the Lord first speaks to Samuel. I mean, imagine being the little boy Samuel, and this is the first time like God's speaking to you. And this is what he says. He just is like, hey, you better get used to it, Samuel, because you're going to be preaching a lot of hard messages. Let's just start right out of the gate. And he says in verse 10, And the Lord came and stood and called his other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli, right? That's what we just read about in chapter 14. All things which I have spoken concerning his house, meaning his family. When I begin, I will also make an end, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever. He said, I'm just going to judge his house for a little while. I'm just going to take out his sons. He said, no, I'm going to judge his house forever. He's going to be under my judgment. Because his sons made themselves vile and restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offerings forever. That's who this guy Ahiah is. He is a descendant of, of, of Eli's sons, Phineas. That's exactly who he is. It says Ahiah the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas. So Phinehas was like his great uncle, basically. The point being is that he is of Eli's house. 
a house that God said, I'm going to curse forever and put them out of the priesthood. And here he is. And what is he? He's this imposter. He's a phony. He's a fake. He's got the ephod on, but God's not with him. You know, we, we read it later. We're not going to get it this week, but you know, towards the end of the chapter, he takes the priest and says, you know, choir of the Lord, whether we should go up, no answer. God's not talking to that guy. Right. Because who's the rightful priest in this story? Samuel. And Samuel had rejected him in the previous chapter. So does that mean, so the right thing for Saul then was been like, hey, I, I must get right. You know, I need to get right. But is that what he does? No, he runs and hides and gets himself another priest. Gets him some fake, some phony to tell him what he wants to hear. And that's what a lot of, you know, Christians do today. When they get out of the fight, you know, when, they, when, they don't, when they're tired of following, you know, that, that hard preacher, when they don't want a Samuel in their life anymore, they, they'll go find themselves in a Hiah. You know, and, and you know what? He looks the part. Man, he's got the ephod on. He's got the right lineage. Although he doesn't, really. <coughs> and you know what? He'll tell him whatever he wants to hear. And you could, those are, the highs are a dime a dozen today. You know, you want to find some church that's just going to tickle your ear and tell you, and scratch your back and tell you what, and say, hey, don't worry about the Philistines. Have some pomegranates. You can stay out of the fight all you want. Dime a dozen. I could put a blindfold on you and just start, you could just start walking. You'll run into one. You really will. <laughs> if you walk long enough, you probably run right into a church like that. Well, there'll be some high up in the pulpit. Just like, don't worry about the Philistines. What Philistines? No, that's not like that. You know, let me feed you the pomegranate of, you know, the ESV. Let me point you the pomegranate of NIV and just keep you out of the fight. So that's what's going on here with the fearful, right, with Saul. But that's not who we want to be like tonight. That's not what we want to do. We want to be like Saul, this fearful person who's not fighting, who's not, you know, getting in there and actually delivering the people from the Philistines. We want to be like Jonathan. And you say, well, you know what? I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be like Saul. I want to be like Jonathan. Well, you know what? That's great, but you better think about what it takes to be a Jonathan. You know, there's some things here in the story about the faithful. And again, as I said earlier, the reason why I'm referring to him as the faithful is because he has a lack of fear. Because it takes faith to go do, you know, to, to go do the things like Jonathan did. It takes faith to go fight these battles. It takes faith to step out and trust God to deliver your enemies into your hand. That's why he's the faithful, because he's not like Saul. He doesn't have fear. And I just love that he says, I, he told not his father. You know, there's no point in telling him. So he goes out, right? <clears throat> and he goes to fight, and it says in verse 4, and between the, and, and between the passages... Uh, by which Jonathan sought to go over into the Philistines garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of, uh, was Bozes and the name of the other uh, Seni. So, you know, these are some important rocks. And when people are naming rocks, yeah, right. these, are, these aren't just, you know, little boulders by the side of the road. These are probably some great huge stones. That they're, they're like a landmark. You know, back then people would say, there was no GPS. You know, they say, how do you get somewhere? Where are you going to go buy the rock of Bozes and Seni? You're going to go through that path. You know, that was like a landmark to them. And they probably had that, you're mentioning it, because it's kind of like it was on either side of this passage, meaning if you wanted to get to him, you probably would have had to go like a great way around, maybe. It would have been difficult to get to where you needed to go. And here's what I'm saying. If you, wanna, if you don't want to be like Saul and be fearful, you want to be like Jonathan and be somebody who is faithful. You know, you're going to have to have faith, because one of the things you have to understand if you're going to step out and do something for God is that there's really only one way to be a Jonathan. There's only one way, and that's to fight. That's to go out and fight. That's to go out and take a stand for God, to go out and fight. And that was the only way he had. There wasn't some alternative route. He had to go through that passage, which led to the Philistines. And you know what? He was fine with that, because that's where he wanted to go. And you know what? You'll never be a Jonathan if, that's not, if you don't want to do that. You never will. If you never want to go out and fight and do something for the Lord... And I'm not saying everyone in this room has to go, you know, light the world on fire for Christ. But, you know, if you want to just go out and live for God, live godly in Christ Jesus and win souls and just be a faithful servant of the Lord in, your, in this life, there's only one way to do it, and that's to fight. You're going to have to go through that passage. You're going to have to go through be the, between these two sharp rocks. You can't go over them. You can't go around them. There's one way through, and it's to fight. And a lot of people don't want to go that passage because they know what's on the other side. They know what, what's on the other side between those two rocks. All it's waiting for is Philistines. All it's waiting is a fight. And they say, you know what? I, you know, the uttermost parts of Gibeah is looking pretty good right about now. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe the old man had something going for him. You know, those, those pomegranates are sounding pretty tasty. A lot of people turn around right there. 
Not Jonathan, though. Why? Because he was faithful. Because he wasn't afraid. And we see that here. And it says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. I love how he says that. He doesn't say, he didn't say it will be. He says, it may be. It may be. It reminds me of like, you know, Esther, you know, where she was going to go in and talk to King uh, Hezeris, if that's how you say it. And he, she said, she asked everybody to pray and not, to, to not eat or drink for three days. And she'll go in and talk to the king because that could have meant a death sentence. That's a whole other story. But her attitude was, if I perish, I perish. She said, you know what? If I go in and I die, then I die. It's kind of like the attitude of uh, the three, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's day when they got tossed into the fire. They said, you know what? God is able to deliver us. And if not, then so what? That was their attitude. That's Jonathan's attitude here. Listen, that's the attitude of anybody that ever does anything for God. That doesn't run away from a fight. Because they understand that sometimes you're going to get in a fight. And when you get in fights, you get hurt. Sometimes you get wounded. Sometimes, you know, you get in a scrap. You don't always come out clean on the other side. Even if you win, a lot of times you win, in a, you ever, you know, I'm not, I don't want to see if anyone who's here has been in a fight, but, you know, when you get into a scrap, you know, let's, you know, let's say when you're just roughhousing, right? Let's keep it Christian here. When you're just roughhousing with a, with a good brother, you know, you're just kind of, you know, wrestling around. And then, you know, usually one guy ends up winning. The other guy gasses or whatever. They get him in a hold or something. But you know what? Even if you win that, you get up, you got to kind of straighten everything out, right? Catch your breath. You don't come out on the other side unscathed. And that's, a that's the attitude you have to, go, have to have if you're going to go through this between these sharp rocks and, and take on the Philistine. You're going to go live the Christian life. You're going to you're gonna mix it up with some people. And he says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. You know, he might. There's a chance. The Lord, will, he, he's more than able. And if it be his will, then we can't lose. If God be for us, who can be against us? Nothing shall separate us from the love which is in Christ Jesus. For there is no strength to the Lord to save by many or by few. You know, and that was Saul's problem back in chapter 13, right? When he had his few, when he had his 3,000 men and he saw the, the multitudes that were like the Philistines that came that were innumerable like sand on the seashore. He didn't, he didn't think like this. This wasn't his attitude. He just thought, well, let's get down to give me an office sacrifice. Let's hurry up. Oh, the Philistines are almost here. Someone give me a sacrifice. We've got to do something about this. That's not acting in faith. You know, that, that's someone who's, act, who's panicking. You could just see the panic in Saul in these two chapters. You can just feel it by the way he's acting. You know, and this is his downfall. You know, he starts to just head downhill because of a lack of faith, because he gets afraid. <coughs> but that's not Samuel's, or excuse me, Jonathan's attitude. He said, you know what? The Lord is to save by many or by few. Like Gideon, right? In the 300. And it says, and his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in thy heart. Now, you can't read the story and not give the armor bearer his props, man. The guy is, he's on, I love this guy. You don't know his name, but you know what? While well, you guys are up in heaven and in certain lines trying to meet Moses and John the Baptist and Elijah, I'm going to go meet this guy. Because that'll be the shorter line. No one ever really thinks about this guy, right? I'll have to ask what his name is, but I'm going to go find him and say, man, you're awesome. I love that attitude. And what I really love about it is in verse 6, it says that he said to his young man that bear his armor. So his armor bearer was a young man. And when he says to him, hey, let's go fight the Philistines. And his armor bearer said unto him, do all that is in thine, in thine heart, to, uh, uh, do that is all in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. He didn't say, whoa, <laughs> I got a lot to live for, man. I know you're kind of getting up there a little bit more, Jonathan. Maybe Jonathan's a little older here. I, I imagine he's about middle-aged. And the young man's just kind of like, that's, that's for you. But, uh, and I'll, I'm, I'll be your armor bearer, but if you're going to lead me into... You know, take me into certain death. You know, I've got a lot going for me right now. That's not his attitude. And that's the kind of attitude you have to have if you're going to do something for God. I, wish, I hope that all, you know, all young people would have that attitude. That they would be willing to just go headlong into the fight, trusting the Lord. They would just go into life knowing that, hey, we're going to face some fights, but if we, you know, God is able to deliver us and watch over us if we remain faithful. And then he said, in verse 8, Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. Look, if you want to be like Jonathan, you're going to have to put yourself out there. You're going to have to discover yourself unto them. You're going to have to put yourself out there. Jesus said, You know, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing to be cast out and trod under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it in a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give the light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
you have to put it out there if it's going to have any effect. Right. It's not going to have any effect up in Gibeah. It's not going to have any effect if you're just running from the fight. He's saying, look, let's go discover ourselves under the Philistines. What is he saying? Let's go pick a fight. That's what he's saying here. And that's what Jesus told us to do, to, to put our good works out there before men. <clears throat> you know, and that's what we try to do here. You know, we try to put our, our sermons out there for everyone to see. The, 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 the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, the sermons that are nice and sweet and motivating. And the other ones that, you know, you know rip face. The other ones that are going to make some people angry. You put it all out there. Discover yourselves unto these people. Show them who you are. Don't be afraid. You know, don't, don't hide at work the fact that you're a Christian. Discover it. Discover yourselves unto them. It might be that you deliver somebody. You might, you might take somebody out of the clutches of the Philistines. Maybe you'll convert a Philistine, you know, and get them to come over to your side. Maybe you'll get some of these, the God's people that are hiding out amongst the Philistines. You know, you let your light so shine before men. You discover yourselves under the, under the people in your life. It might surprise you who else is a Christian. I remember when, uh, you know, I'm just, this is just coming to mind when my mom passed away. She had this friend from, from when we lived in South Dakota. And she had like, I, I mean, I grew up knowing this lady. And after my mom passed away and she, got, she had gotten saved on her deathbed, and um, this lady called, this, my, the, her, my mom's friend. Uh, and her name was Della. And she said, and she was all tearful and she wanted to hear. And she said, hey, I just want to know, you know, did your mom get saved? And I was shocked. I'm like, yeah, she did. She's like, oh, good, because I was really praying for her. I'm like, you're a Christian? <laughs> you know, you never know who's going to be, who is a Christian out there, who is just kind of not willing to discover themselves. All the Christians that you might be around you that are just like Saul. You know, they don't want the, they don't want to, you know, upset the Philistines around them either. They just want to have some pomegranates. They, wanna, they don't want to cause any trouble. But you know what? When, when, you're fear, when you're faithful, when you're fearless, when you're bold, when you discover yourself, when you let your light shine, you know what it does? It inspires other people. It move, moves other people. It motivates other people to do the same. I mean, that's what you see in this passage. That's what we see happening in this chapter. You know, he discovers himself. He puts himself out there. And then later in the story, you know, he inspires others. And we'll get to that. But he goes on, he says, if they say, so he's discovering himself in verse 9, in verse 8, and he says in verse 9, if they say unto us, thus unto us, tarry until we come unto you, then we will stand in our place, and we will not go up, not go up unto them. Now notice when he said there, and, and go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 real quick, 1 Timothy chapter 6. He didn't say, you know, if they, if they, uh, if they, if they, if they say unto us, tarry till we come to you, we're going to come down to you, then we're going to turn around and run back to Gibeah. Then we're going to turn around and get back to my dad. That's not what he said. He said, if they do that, we will stand still in our place. What is he saying? He's saying, we're going to hold our ground. If they come down unto us, we're going to stand right here. Here's where we'll fight. We'll take them on right here. We're not going to give them another inch. You know, and that's the attitude you have to have if you're going to be like Jonathan. And by the way, you know, those are the two options that you have in life. There's no third option in the story. You know, you're either going to be Saul or you're going to be Jonathan. You're either going to live your life hanging out on the mountaintop, eating your fruit, maybe not getting any fights and taking up, take, you know, get, uh, mixing up with anybody, but you know what? At the end of the day, you're a coward. At the end of the day, you're not going to get anything done for God. Or you're going to be like Jonathan, somebody who's willing to go out, pick a fight, get, you know, get involved, and do something for God. And, and you know what? And even if it comes down to it, say, I'm going to stand my ground. If they come to me, you know, that, if a guy is looking to pick a fight, he doesn't care where it goes down. He's either going to take it to them or they can take it or they can come get it. That's his attitude here. I love it. Look at 1 Timothy, where to have you go, uh, chapter 6. And this is the attitude that you have to have if you're going to live for Christ. You have to, you know, you have, to have a, 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 a soldier's mindset, a warrior's mindset. He says in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. So what were the things that he was fleeing? Well, back up to chapter 10. The love of money, which is the root of all evil which some have coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, he says earlier, you know, that we should be content, right? Verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world for a certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, don't get caught up with the pomegranates in life because all they're going to do is just draw you away from the battle. He's saying, look, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, uh, 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 faith, love, patience, meekness. And what's he saying in verse 12? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. And he's not saying like earn eternal life. He's saying like lay hold on the fact 
that you are born again, that you're saved, that you have eternal life. You know, I think, I wonder sometimes, why is it some Christians get out of the fight? Why is it that some Christians just never get, you know, get in the fight like they should? Why is it they're not going to be like Timothy and fight the good fight of faith? It's because they've never laid hold on eternal life. They're saved. They're going to go to heaven. But I just don't think it really ever registers with them. They never really stop to think exactly what it is that they have in Christ. I mean, you ever just meditate about that and think about what it's going to be like to stand before God Almighty, to see Christ with, your, with, the, with these eyes, to hear his actual voice, to stand in his presence, to be in heaven, to, like we read last week in, in, in Revelation, you know, to be in that throng praising God in heaven. You know, lay hold on eternal life. You say, I'm having a hard time getting in the fight. You know what you need to do? You need to lay hold on eternal life. Think about it. Think about what's, gonna, what, what's really going to matter at the end of this life. You know, as a Christian, you're not going to get into this life. You know, Saul's not going to get to the end before he falls on a sword and say, I wish I had eaten more pomegranates. You know, he's going to say, I wish, you know, I'd gone with Jonathan. I wish I had led the charge. I wish I had waited for Samuel. I wish I had gotten involved. Right. He's going to say, I wish I had fought the, the, I wish I would have, you know, fought the good fight of faith. I wish I would have done that. Now go over to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, this is something he, admo Paul admonishes Timothy repeatedly. He says in verse, uh, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Why is he telling me to be strong? Because it takes strength to fight. You know, you can't be a spiritual weakling and expect to go take on the Philistines. And how do you build spiritual muscle? Bible reading, church attendance, Bible memory, getting out, having your senses exercised in the word of God, discerning good and evil, going out doing the soul winning and, and learning these things. Be strong in the Christ that is in Christ Jesus. And the thing which thou heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Faithful men that are going to be able to teach others also, right? Not Saul's, Jonathan's. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look, the Christian life is hard. It's hard. It's not easy. And there's a million people out there, there's plenty of preachers out there today that will stand up and tell you it's easy. And it's not. They're lying to you. If you're going to make it and, and really do something for God, you know, you're going to run up against the Philistines. You're going to have to endure some hardness. And it's going to come to you. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. Right. You know, it's going to come from one shape, shape, you know, it's going to come in one uh, shape or form or another. It's going to come to you in your life. Be it from family, co-workers, the world, even your own heart and mind. The devil, it's going to come. He says in verse 4, no man that warreth, entang I, you know, catch the language here, warreth. He's talking about living the Christian life. He's talking about being a man of God, about doing something for the Lord. He's talking about being a soldier. He's talking about, you know, fighting the good fight of faith. A man that warreth, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You know, he's not following after the money and the covetousness. He's content with such things as he has. And he's more concerned with eternal things, with fighting the fight, because he's laid hold on eternal life. He says, uh, he, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know who it is that you need to please in this life? Christ Amen. and nobody else. Amen. And that takes a, a, a willingness to endure hardness. Because, you know, the world hated Christ. And, you know, marvel not. You know, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. And he's saying, look, if you're going to please me, people are going to hate you. And you have to be willing to endure some hardness in order to please me. And you know what? And, and, and in order to please him, you have to be what? A soldier. A soldier. A good soldier. Not just a soldier, but a good one. Right? Not a soldier who doesn't put the armor on and get involved. But a soldier who goes out and picks a fight and says, hey, we're gonna, God is able to deliver by few or by many. And we're going to go out there and see what God's going to do. And see if God will do something. And you know what? And if the enemy wants to come down here and fight, that's where we'll fight. That's what we'll get it on. <clears throat> he said, if they will come unto us, go ahead and turn back. You might want to keep something in the New Testament. We're going to be back there in a minute. He said, stand still in our place. We will, go up, uh, we will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us and we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hands. And, it, and this shall be a sign unto us. So I love his attitude. Well, we can fight down here or we can fight up there. <laughs> I don't care because God can deliver by many or by few. You know, if, 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 I don't care where they want to fight today. You know, the, the, the haters of the Lord. 
They want to fight online. They want to come down here and protest. You know, they want wherever they want to uh, fight. You know, and, and by the way, I'm not talking about a physical fight like we're reading about here. Right. You know, we war. You know, we fight against. You know, our, our spiritual our warfare is a spiritual warfare. Okay, so he says here. You know, uh, we will go. We will. Uh, if they say thus, uh, come up, uh, uh, come up unto us. Excuse me. Then we will go up, for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. So you know, hold your ground. You know, and he goes on in verse eleven. It says. And both of them discovered themselves in the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews have come forth out of the holes that they, uh, they hid, had hid themselves. Wouldn't you hate that to be said of, uh, uh, about you as a Christian? Wouldn't you hate one of God's enemies to say, Oh, look, they're coming out of their hiding place. Right. Oh, look, they're, he's not scared anymore. Look, we got one who's, you know, who's got a little grit. This is funny. Look at, that, look at the silly little Hebrew down there. Wouldn't you hate that to be said about you? Wouldn't that make you mad? Be, to be known as the one who's hiding in a hole. That's the way a lot of God's people are. A lot of Christians out there, they're hiding out in the holes, too afraid to go fight. You know what? They'll never be like Jonathan. They'll just be fearful people the rest of their life. They'll never be faithful like Jonathan. And it says in uh, verse 12, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan in his armor and said, Come up, uh, come up to us. We will show you a thing. I told him to come up here. <laughs> I said, I got something to show him. You know what I'm going to show him? This, shing, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm going to show him. And Jonathan wasn't like, whoa, what do you got? Oh, just hold it out. We can see it from here. He's like, hey, let's go. Let's do this. It says, and the men of the gar garrison answered Jonathan and his armor and said, come up unto us and we will show you things. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of, the, uh, of Israel. And he didn't say, and I love it, you know, and he's giving credit where it's due. He said, it's the Lord that's doing it. You know, he stepped out in faith. You know, he didn't have any fear, but you know what? That's just part of the equation. You also have to have the faith. And if, you're full, if your heart is full of fear, you're never going to have the faith. I mean, that's what faith is, saying, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I'm not sure whether or not God's going to deliver me or, or if we're going to, you know, end up on the wrong end of the sword or whatever. But I'm willing to go out and fight and find out. I'm willing to put myself out there and see what happens. Because again, God doesn't protect people that don't bother putting themselves in harm's way as I've preached earlier. <clears throat> so it says, uh, let's go up, and, and, and he says, look, we got him. Come up after me. The Lord hath delivered him into my hand of Israel. I mean, he's confident. He hasn't even pulled out the sword yet. And you say, man, I want to do that. I want to be like Jonathan. Well, look at the next verse. He says, and Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. It wasn't just like, oh, they made, in fact, the Philistines have made this nice little path for us. There's a ladder right there, guys. Come on up. Jonathan was like, look, the, the Lord's delivered them. That we can go win this battle, but they're up there. And he had to climb up on his hands and on his feet. And that means it was really steep. You ever climbed a mountain like that or gone up a steep bank? I did once a long time ago. <laughs> Years and a few pounds ago. But, uh, <laughs> right? but you ever climb up and you're like, oh, man, it's like so steep you use your hands to kind of claw into it and climb up. And that's what's going on, uh, going on here. So look, it's great that, you know, he, he's, he's got the right attitude. You know, it's great that he put himself out there, that he stepped out in faith, <coughs> that he's willing to go fight, doesn't matter where. And if it's up there, that you know what, that's where we'll go. But here's the thing you got to understand if you're going to be like Jonathan, is that it's not going to be easy. And that you have to do your part. Yeah, God was, hey, Jonathan, go on up, I'll deliver him. But you know what, Jonathan, you got to go up. God didn't just teleport him up there. He said, you got to do your part. If you want to go take on this battle, you have to do your part. If you want to go see God do, you know, you know, wrought a great victory in your life. You know, whether it's, you know, a victory over sin, you know, we want God to, you know, free us from certain sins or, or to deliver us from temptation and lead us not into temptation. And he will. He'll give us the spiritual strength. You know, he'll give us everything that we need to do that. You know, the, the, the word of God is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. He will not uh, suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, God provides that way of escape, but you're still the one who has to run through it. You're still the one who has to do your part to get the victory over sin or whatever it is in your life. If you want to be like Jonathan and do something for God, you still have to do your part. Say, oh, I want to be a preacher one day. You know, I want to preach the word of God. Well, are you reading it? How are you going to preach it if you haven't read it? Oh, I want to go win souls. I want to win souls to Christ. Do you even know how to give the gospel? Because if you don't, how are you going to do that? You still have to do your part. Jonathan still had to climb up on his hands and his feet. 
And it's not easy. In, in the old newsflash, your part isn't always going to be easy. You know, and I'm glad for that. I'm glad that God doesn't just make everything easy because that would be boring. If everything in life was just easy, there'd be no sense of accomplishment. There'd be no sense of, you know, you get no fulfillment out of it. Sure. It's good to do a hard thing. You know, we're living in a generation today, in a w culture today, where everything wants to just come, come to them easy. They just want to download it. You know, they want to live like, they want to be, you know, just, just, just be able to just push a button and just have it show up. They want to pull out their phone and they don't want to go to the grocery store. Now look, if you're a busy housewife, I get it. Please, you know. <laughs> If you can, don't go to I mean, That's what my wife does. You know what I'm saying? People develop this attitude where just everything should come easy. You know, you know if you're getting Taco Bell delivered to your door, <laughs> I don't know. Can you at least go get the Taco Bell yourself? I don't know. And if you're getting Taco Bell, what's wrong with you? you know, you're in Tucson, people. I don't know Juanitos. Tell them I sent you. But you know what I'm saying? People, you know, they want a drone to drop it off. They just want everything to come to them. They want everything to come easy in life. People don't want to put any effort. You know, but here's the thing. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You know, aim small, miss small. If you don't put yourself out there, if you don't work hard at something, you're not going to accomplish anything. You know, I read a, a great quote the other day, it was something I was thinking about. It said, discipline is the bridge between, uh, uh, it's the bridge between ambition and accomplishment, or desire and accomplishment. And discipline is the bridge between desires and accomplishment. Say, I want to do something for God. Well, you know what? You have to do your part. And a lot of it, you know, a lot of times is discipline. And that's like a dirty word today. People don't, ooh, discipline. Yeah. I don't want to hear about that. But, you know, the, I mean, well, you might not like being a disciple of Jesus Christ then. Because, you know what? Being a disciple involves a lot of discipline. But, he, you know what? He was willing to do his part. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll start winding it down here. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 10. I'll begin in verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. There's that word again, being strong. Right? Because you've got to be a warrior. You've got to fight. Be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Like Jonathan. He was going out in God's might. Put on the whole armor of God. You know, be, you know what? Be, be, you know, you know, be strong in the, in the power of God's might. But don't forget to put the armor on. Don't just walk out into the... Into the you know, it'd be like the guy that's just going to walk out into the battle you know, in his whitey tighties. <laughs> it's not going to go well for you. You know, they don't, that's not how they do it over, you know, where, where they fight wars. Say, ah, oh, you're good. You know, what, you, you know, you're in your sweatpants and, and your t-shirt. That's not how you go to war. And that's how a lot of people want to fight the Christian life. They go, oh, I'm going to do it in the power of his might. And God's like, put the armor on then. Do your part. Be willing to climb up on your hands and your feet. You know, put on the whole armor of God. Get it all on, not just some of it. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of, the wor of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, Philistines that you got to climb up to go fight, right? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. They may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all. So how many, he's just, you know, take it all on, put it all on, put the whole armor on. He's just saying it. Put it all on. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all things, taking the shield of faith where you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Did you catch all that? He's talking about, you know, having yourself girt about with truth. You know, having the breastplate on, putting on the helmet of salvation. The, having your feet shod with the gospel of peace. But did you, did you hear anything about the back? You hear, anything, hear him say anything? And make sure you cover your backside. Make sure you get that on there too. No, he doesn't mention anything about it. You know why? Because God doesn't count on his people retreating. And that's not Jonathan's attitude. He doesn't count on people just turning tail and running away. That's not what he's, you know, that's why he doesn't include that bit of the armor. He doesn't say anything for the back because he expects his people to go forward. And, do, and to fight and take on the enemy. Right. Like Jonathan. You know, and that's what you have to be if you're going to be faithful. <laughs> you say, it's hard. Yeah. And that's the Christian life. It's hard. And if you're going to do something for God, you know, he'll be there. He'll help you. But you have to do your part too. And you know what? The guy, the, you know, you could be, or you could be like Saul. You can go hide. 
and eat your pomegranates. But you know what? Eventually the pomegranates all start to kind of taste the same. And eventually, you know what? They, they lose their flavor. The view up there in Gibeah is just turns into any old place. It gets boring not being in the fight. Man, the Christian life, it might be hard, but it's exciting. Yeah. It is. You never know what's around the corner. Right. You know, soul winning, you know, people are like, oh, soul winning. Why are you so excited about that? Because it's exciting. Right. You never know who you're going to knock on the door what that person's going to be like. I mean, it's great when we get to talk to somebody and give them the gospel. That's, that's great, right? We're like, we rejoice. But you know, sometimes it's exciting when you get that jerk. <laughs> I'm just being honest here. You know what? And maybe we just need to have that kind of an attitude like, hey, what's the worst that could happen? And sometimes it's quite entertaining the way people are. And you get, I, sometimes I get a real chuckle out of it. You know, because the, the whole COVID thing with the whole mask thing right now, this is my favorite thing. Because they're... Because this is the, every person that would have told you to go away, no matter what, now they have like this handy excuse. And look, if people want to wear the mask out soul winning, th that's great. I think, you know, go ahead. I carry one in my back pocket all the time. I'm ready to put it on. I knocked on this lady's door the other day, and she comes to like the glass on the side, and she's just like, looks at me, hey, I'm from a Baptist church. She's like, you go, you're not wearing masks. And like, I'm like, and I just is like, I could put one on if you'd like. And she's like, no, thanks. <laughs> You know, and I just, you know, I, there's really no point to that. I'm not like pro or anti-mask or anything. I'm just saying I got a chuckle out of that. I'm like, oh, you want me to put one on then? I, I guess the problem really isn't the mask then, is it, sweetheart? It's this book right here. It's when I said church, right? That was the problem. And what I'm saying is like, look, you know, the Christian life is exciting. I get chuckled. I mean, we could probably go around the room to tell stories. I've got stories. I'm, it's already getting late. I can't tell a bunch of stories up here. <laughs> But I have soul winning stories. And you get with other soul winners, you know what they have? Stories. And they make us laugh. And they, they make us say, wow, it's exciting. But let me ask you this. Is soul winning easy? Is it easy when it's 100 and, well, it was 111 up in Phoenix. So it's probably like 108, nice and cool down here. <laughs> Talking like a real Tucsonian now. You know, I mean, I wouldn't want to do it in Phoenix where it's blazing hot, but down here where it's nice and cool. <laughs> right? No, it's hard down here too. It's hard down here, too. You know, it, it's not always the weather that's the hard part. Sometimes it's just having to drag your carcass out there and make yourself do it because you know it's the right thing to do. You just have to go out there and do it. It's hard. Well, that's the Christian life, but it's also exciting. I mean, look what happened with Jonathan here. And it says, uh, and the first slaughter which Jonathan and his... And it, I love that word, slaughter. You know, it wasn't a fight. It wasn't a battle. I mean, he goes up there and he just slaughters these guys. I mean, it's like he just the way the Bible says it's, they didn't even stand a chance. And he just goes up there and it's just, it's a bloodbath. You know, he just, him and his armor bearer just clean house, no problem. Because God's on their side. Amen. And when was God on their side? After they did their part, right? And I won't belabor the point anymore. <coughs> and the first slaughter which Jonathan <coughs> and his armor bearer made was about 20 men. Two guys take on 20 guys. As it were, an half acre of land. So that's like the space that they were fighting in. Which a yoke of oxen might plow. And you know what I get out of that is this, is that you say an acre of land, you know, that's not a lot. Yeah, but every little bit counts. Every little bit counts when you're taking on the enemy. You say, man, you're going to go soul winning for so, you know, you go soul winning on this day and that day. How many hours? You know, I'm not saying you don't have to go every day, but I'm just saying some people go a lot because they are able to and stuff like that. You know, and people would scratch their heads. So why? Because every soul is worth it. Every, you know, if we go out soul winning, you know, 12 of us go out on a Sunday afternoon for three hours and one person gets saved, you know, and I get, well, I got to burn up all the gas and buy all the Raspados <laughs> and maybe have one myself, right? You know what? Worth it. Amen. Worth all the money, worth all the sweat, worth all the, you know, not giving myself my Baptist nap that Sunday because it was, you know, that one, that half acre of land, that one soul, that one little bit that other people just go, pfft. What do you mean you're going to go, go into the ghetto and try and save some derelict who's not even going to come to church? What, what good is that? What have you accomplished? Well, I've got one half acre here. You know, and next week I'll go out and I'll get another half acre. And next week we'll go out and we'll cover another half acre. And the week after that we'll go have a cover, and soon we'll cover this whole city. Amen. And then we'll get to heaven and we'll, you know, we'll compare real estate. You know, this guy, you know, me and the guy with the bad attitude, us and the guy with the bad attitude, the church that doesn't want anything in Christ. Now let's get to heaven and let's add up all those half acres. You know, you were hanging out up in Gibeah eating pomegranates. We were out there, like Jonathan, you know, trying to get back a half acre here and there. And then, and then it'll come home for those people. Then they'll go, oh, well, I guess that is worth it. Yeah, it is. Even that half acre. 
And then look here, it says in verse 15, and I'll wrap it up, and he says, And there was trembling in the host in the field and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, and they trembled. And the earth quaked, so it was a very great trembling. I just love that. And he goes up and fights this battle. Everyone starts, the Philistines just start losing their mind. They're, they're freaking out. God sends this big earthquake. Everyone's just, you know, on the run. And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away like wax. You know, like you ever just a candle, just there's just no strength, just <laughs> in a hot candle. That's what these this great host that had come out against God's people. Innumerable. Tens of thousands of chariots. And and Saul go and one guy goes out with his armor bearer and does and takes on a half acre of land, takes on twenty guys in, in, in the strength of the Lord. And and then God says, I'll respond to that. You know what? I see that. I'll send an earthquake. And I'll turn every man against his, his neighbor. And they just they were just like a you just, you know. Just pushing your hand through a, through a piece of clay. They just melted away. It was that easy for God. They melted away and they went down beating down one another. I mean, they just can't get away fast enough. Like, ah, trying to get away. Just clamoring over one another. And what was the big deal? Just, just one guy and his armor bearer. It was just 20 guys that fell in an earthquake. Look, God responds to faith. God responds to faith. That's the, that's the, the thrust of this message. That's why you should be like Jonathan, because that's what God's going to respond to, your faith. You know, and you, or you could be like Saul. You know, you could just be looking, oh, the watchman of Saul and Gibeah, but Benjamin looked. Oh, look what they're doing over there. Look what's going on over there. Wish I could have a part in that. Well, you know what? You're going to have to come down from Gibeah, put your pomegranate down for a little while, and pick up a sword and a shield, and get out there, and go climb up and take on some Philistines. Mm. And not be afraid. You need to have some faith because that's what God responds to. People are willing to step out and do the work in faith. <clears throat> then Saul said unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who is gone from us. He didn't say, Whoa, Rally the troops. Let's go. He's like, Find out who's, who's responsible for that. Who did that? Who went out there without my orders and started a fight with the Philistines? Because he remembers what just happened the last time somebody went out and took on a garrison. The Philistines showed up. I mean, you could just see it in Saul. He's just, he's just running scared at this point. And it's a shame because he started out so great, right? But he's saying, look, find out who did that. And, it, and they numbered him. Behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And he's like, the boy's at it again. He's like, the boy's doing it again. Won't, we, won't he learn? And that's why I love that. Yeah, but he told not his, his, <laughs> he told not his father, right? Because you know the saying? Probably a lot of husbands know this one, right? Maybe even wives. I don't know. The kids, plug your ears. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's easier, to, uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Right? <laughs> you didn't hear that, right? That's kind of what this story reminds me of. He's just like, you know what, Dad? I'm going to go do it without you. And then Saul, you know, he's looking. He's watching. Well, you know, that's why you could, be, you could be one of these people. You can be Jonathan or you can be Saul. You can be the fearful. You can be the faithful. You could just stand on the sidelines and watch God's people do something great. Watch God respond to their faith. Watch them just turn to flight the armies, right? Or you can get involved and be one of them. Amen. And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark of God, for the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. So now he's got his, his fake priest involved. You know, now he's trying to like, well, let's, let's, uh, let's try to take credit for this somehow. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, look, dude, the, the earthquake already started. What are you, what are you grabbing the ark for? What, who cares what Ahiah has to say? <laughs> the fight's already on. The people are already, the Philistines are running over each other, beating down one another as they went, trying to get away from these people. Earthquake comes, he's like, oh, well, let's get the ark in here. <laughs> why? Because he wants to, like, save face. That's what I think is going on. He wants to kind of try, try to take credit. You know, and that's, that, that's the typical, you know, that's the attitude some people have. These Saul's that want to sit on the sideline, oh, that'll never work. And then it does, and they're like, oh, I knew it all along. And they try to get involved, try to take credit. They're freeloaders, right? And it came to pass while Saul talked to the priest that the noise was in the host of the Philistines and went on and increased. So while he's busy trying to get the ark ready and make the, it's like the noise is getting louder. The, it's just, it's getting more intense. And then Saul said to the priest, well, withdraw in thy hand. You know, he's like, then he comes to his senses like, no, nah, you know what? Never mind. Don't worry about the ark. Turns out we don't need it. Why? Because God, because as Saul will learn later in life, as we'll read soon, that God, God is more pleased with obedience than he is with sacrifice. God responds more to somebody's faith than he does to just, you know, ceremony. 
God does, he's like, he doesn't care about the ark. It's just a box to him. It's just a dumb box. That, yeah, I mean, it had importance. It was valuable. It was something that would, back then that had significance. But in the grand scheme of things, what really pleased God in the story was Jonathan's right. faith. His willing to just step out there and try to do something for God when nobody else wanted to. You know, not, not getting the ark. And finally, Saul kind of comes to his sense and says, you know what? Forget it. And it's this fake spirituality that's showing through here. It says in verse 20, And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves, and they came to the battle. So he comes to his sense. He's like, all right, let's get involved. Right? And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was a very great discomfiture. I mean, the Philistines are just fighting one another. And that's how God does it. Remember Gideon, the story of Gideon? When they broke the lampers, it said the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it says that, they, that the, the, I can't remember who it was, but the Midianites. the Midianites, thank you, they all stood up and they fought one another. Right. They did, Gideon didn't have to bloody his sword one bit. He didn't have to, he just, chink, well, well, they'll take care of themselves. Right. And that's the same thing that's going on here. Saul finally shows up late to the battle. And behold, every man's sword is against his fellow, and there was a very great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were the Philistines before that time, which went up into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites. There was Saul and Jonathan. I mean, that's how far the Philistines had got in, where the Hebrews were just like, well, we'll just hang out with you. And, that, you know, and that's what I was getting to earlier. And, 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 it says, and it says in verse 22, Likewise, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they had heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. And I said this earlier is that when you step out of faith and do something for God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to inspire other people. When you put yourself out there and say, I'm willing to take on these Philistines. I'll, I'll go up on my hands and feet. I'll do my part. I'll just trust God. And whatever happens, happens. I'll just step out in faith and do it. You know what you're going to do? You're going to inspire other people to follow you. You're going to inspire other people to do the same. They're going to come out. You know, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to say, the Hebrews that were the Philistines are going to say, you know what? <laughs> Enough of this. I'm with these guys. You know, I, I, the guys, the Christians that have been running scared, they're going to say, well, look, look, these guys are doing okay. Look, they're stepping on faith. They're putting themselves out there. I mean, that's kind of the story of, of Faith Word Baptist Church in a way, when you think about it. Yeah. You had Pastor Anderson, you know, didn't start out with this many people. One guy in his living room just preaching the Word of God, putting it out there, putting himself out on the Internet, and it inspired other people. You know, 2009, you preach against the Barack Obama, tell him to melt like a snail. <laughs> The media blows up, the liberal media, I mean, national headlines, hate preacher. But you know what also happened is some other Christians went, well, look, let's, look at the, there's somebody taking a stand for God. And inspired people. And now look at it. You know, I dare say that if he had never put himself out there, you know, some of us might not even be in this room right now. Some of us might still be with the Philistines hanging out. And all I'm saying, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to give credit where it's due, but what I'm trying to say is we can do the same thing again. You know, you could do that in your life. You know, you might not inspire a movement. You might not have, you know, cop, you make hundreds of people, change, whatever. But you know what? You might go out and get a half acre. You might go out and inspire a few people. You know, parents might inspire their children to live for God. You might inspire, you know, another family member. You might inspire another Christian. You know, you, you'll cause other people to get over on your side, come over to the Lord's side and fight alongside you. That's what happens when you step out in faith. And that's what I'm trying to encourage us to do tonight. And I love how it ends here. So the Lord saved, that, well, how it's going to end tonight. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over unto Beth Haven. You know what that means is that they pursued them. Not, now they're just turning, not, I mean, they're fighting them, and now they're chasing them back to Beth Haven. They're chasing them right out of Michmash. And why was it? Because one guy said, you know what? I'm tired of Saul. I'm tired of just laying around on this pomegranate tree, up in the uttermost parts of Gibeah, I'm going to go down and pick a fight. And that's what we need today. We need people to not be fearful, but faithful, who are willing to put themselves out there and fight, inspire others. But here's the warning. It's hard. It's not going to be easy. But you know what? That's why so few people do it. That's why so few people do it. They say, you know what? It's too hard. I'm, I don't want to do that. Pomegranates are nice. The view in Gibeah is pretty good, pretty, I bet, up there on that high mountain. But you know what? It's probably dull and, and not very exciting. So that's, you know, that's the message tonight. You know, don't be like Saul. Be like Jonathan. Be willing to put yourself out there. You never know who you're going to inspire. The half acre of land that you claim back is worth every bit of effort you're going to put into it. Don't be fearful. Be faithful. Let's go ahead and pray.